Welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown, the podcast where we watch scary movies so you don't have to. From award-winning to completely unknown, we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Solange Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously as we take these movies seriously. What movie are we talking about today, Mikey? Well, you should know that because we were just at the movie theater watching this movie. Uh, Do we only watch movies in theaters now? Yes. How exciting. That's the only thing we do with our lives now. Well, I think today proved that if we only watch movies in theaters, we are going to rapidly run out of movies that are actually horror movies. I think it, I think your monster from 2024 actually proved that we've already run out of movies that are horror movies. At least the first 90% of the movie did. Did it, indeed. So normally we try to do like a little recap of what the movie is, like overall what's happening in the movie, right? Yeah. But I am finding it difficult to do that for this movie because in order to recap what the movie is supposed to be about, I have to say something different than what the movie was actually about. I think there's definitely some of that going on, but that's good. That's called art. So should we start with what the movie is supposed to be about? Yeah. Let's just say... This is not a horror movie, and we kind of knew that going in. I was expecting something a little closer to horror than it was, but this is our first ever romance movie review. It's billed as a horror romance. That's what it called itself. It It said it was going to be a horror romance romance. And here's the thing. I have seen people toying with this idea. Like, you know, I've seen like social media memes and things. And, you know, I'm on like writer Facebook sometimes Mm -hmm. still. And, you know, they'll post little like synopses, right? They'll be like, oh, what if? And they'll, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the concept of horror romance. Mm -hmm. And I I'm here for the idea. Hmm. I think it's an interesting mashup, or it could be, which is why I wanted to see this movie. Well, I know that there have been more than one movies about zombies in love, whether one or both of the people in the couple is a zombie. Mm -hmm. And sometimes ghosts, too. Mm -hmm. Like Ghost, for example. Like Ghost. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I've never been interested in the whole zombie romance thing, because that's not okay. Wait, What's not okay? Um, Necrophilia, for one. So if one is a zombie. Yeah. What if they're both zombies? It's still not okay because presenting zombies as thinking, emotional beings that could be in love just like throws out the whole concept of zombies. Because then then where does Soli's rules come in? You're going to murder these nice, wonderful people that could be in love? Ordinarily. I would be right there with you, especially when you invoke Soli's rule of zombies. I knew that would get you. However, I just have one thing to say. Yes. Anna and the Apocalypse. Is somebody in love with a zombie in that movie? The couple that's madly in love, one of them becomes a zombie and the other one, spoilers, becomes a zombie at the end to be with him because they are madly in love. Wow. See, I don't like that. I don't like that Yeah, but it was done so concept. cute in that movie. Okay, whatever. So you don't like zombies in love? No. What about ghosts? When someone falls in love with a ghost? That's fine. Because ghosts are people. They're Spect- dead people too. They're spectral people. Whereas zombies, zombies are animalistic. They're what you get when you take the brain out of a person. Like, not literally, but they no longer think they're just monsters. You know what's also animalistic? The beast. The monster who lives in your closet who looks exactly like Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Exactly. Yes. I was very uncomfortable. I was very disappointed that that this movie that I knew was going to be about a monster in the closet had Beast from Beauty and the Beast as the monster. Like, I was hoping for something like Sully, you know? Like... (laughs) That Some... would have made that that scene even worse. <laughs> oh, that scene, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like 
Don't don't say it's a monster in your closet. And then he's like this swashbuckling fellow. I mean, he looked like Beast from the like whatever eighties nineties series. Yeah, it was, it was called Beauty and the Beast, huh? It was something along those lines, and but, it was like he he yeah. solved crimes or some nonsense. <laughs> of like of course he, was, he did. He was a he was in the eighties officer or something. <laughs> I don't even remember. I don't know. I didn't watch it because it was stupid then, and it's stupid now. Yes, I've always been a non fan of Beast in that sense. I like when Beast is blue and has glasses, which again, sounds like Sully, (laughs) but I'm actually referring to the X-Men. Yes. Okay. So fine. I guess there are times where those things work for me. I understand why they don't for you. Like that's fine. I wanted a horror movie with rom-com tropes added in. I think that could be really something. I think that could be so good. I wanted it to be... Okay, you know the... um, Can I sneak in and say I enjoy rom-coms? Not... What? I do. What? For comedic purposes. The romance is... I'm a man. But like, you know, like Forgetting Sarah Marshall is very funny. That's a rom-com. Fine. I mean, and I love a rom-com. I love a rom-com. And it is because of the calm side of it, not so much the rom side of it. But I do like, I like the feel good, like, oh, you know, falling into your, Mm -hmm. you know, the arms of the person you've been pining after. Like, I get that. Like there's, it it, it triggers all kinds of, you know, yummy chemicals in your brain, right? And they happen to be the prince of an Eastern European country. Of course they do. And they're going to throw you a fancy Christmas ball. Anyway, I I don't like those kind of rom-coms. I like the good ones. Whatever. I think that a horror movie with those tropes in it, where you're making fun of the tropes, where like, like I wanted, I wanted a horror movie like Freddy Krueger, Freddy (laughs) Krueger, Yeah. (laughs) but the girl keeps falling in love with him and he's just like so annoyed by it because (laughs) he's just trying to do his job and she won't leave him alone. Yeah. That's a funny horror romance. She's taking sleeping pills so that she can dream. Yes. And he's like, I have other people to murder. (laughs) Boundaries. (laughs) Stay out of my dream world right like there are things that could have been done that would have been where you could have still had the horror but it would have been super funny and there's so many different ways they could have gone with this instead what they did was they just made not only a bad romance movie but like a bad bad romance movie like like toxic relationship romance yeah but i it is about like going against those things. Like it's full of those things, but she's the victim of them and we're supporting her. Okay. But also the monster who's by mm. his, by the way, his name is monster through the whole movie. Yeah. Cause monsters don't have names, which just elevates the animalism piece of it. Uh huh. Anyway, monster is portrayed through at least the first half of the movie, if not more. Okay. I'm going to say more. Through 95% of the movie, movie, Monster is the good guy, right? He's the, he's the one she's falling for. Who's going to like, he's better for her than the guy who threw her out when she was diagnosed with cancer. Only he's not. (laughs) Because he's literally throwing her out. (laughs) Because he, he, right. He's moved into her mother's house. He gives her two weeks to find somewhere else to live before he throws her out of her mother's house that she owns and he's squatting in. He's squatting in it, but he's lived there as long as she has. Irrelevant. <laughs> All right. It's not his house. I mean, monsters got to live somewhere. But he's throwing her out. He throws things, punches walls, yeah. slams doors, screams in her face when he's angry. Threatens to eat people. Threatens to tear her throat out. Oh, he did do that. He is an angry, abusive man. Mm-hmm. And, and his whole thing, even when he's not being angry and abusive, his whole thing is, you know, very hmm, alpha male. Like, well, it's just, it's definitely it's toxic. Yeah, it's somebody who's so confident that they don't have to follow any rules and they're just like, eh, whatever. And the kind of guy who throws plates on the floor, not out of rage, but out of like, this makes me feel good and you should do it too. And she's like, those are my mom's plates. And 
he's just like, yeah, so throw him. And she does, and she says, oh, that feels good, because she buys right into it. He gaslights her constantly. He sneaks up behind her, and when she tells him not to, because it startles her, he says, oh, you're fine. Like, he is so dismissive of her feelings. And even when he's being quote unquote nice to her, it's in the form of nagging about how she's not nice enough to herself. Like he is terrible to her on every level. I was so angry through the first half of this movie about how he was treating her. Now here's where I want to go with that. I want to jump ahead to what is really going on in this movie for a second, which uh, we don't know this for sure, but it's strongly implied, I think, that there is no monster. No. It, it's all in her head. She's hallucinating, and she ends up killing somebody as a result. And that is interesting because that means this is her self-talk, her hateful self-talk. And here's the thing. For me, if they had set that up, if the audience was in on the secret through the whole movie, this would have been an entirely different movie and I would have liked it. I would have been, mm. I would have actually really thought that was interesting. But the audience is not in on that and it is not, it's not even hinted at. It's literally just, there's a guy who <laughs> has face makeup on living in her house <laughs> and she just accepts that he's there and he can tell her what to do and yeah. all of these things. And, like, I get that you're probably supposed to be like, well, that's not very realistic. Like, she didn't call the police. Like, mm, she's not acting like there's a person in her house. You know what? If there weren't so many women in the world right now who were being treated in such a way and who had been raised to think that they could be treated in such a way, that they would let that happen to them? Yeah. I might have been more skeptical about it. But as is, I was like, yeah, this is the kind of toxic BS that romance novels I, very like, much n- turn into romance when well, it's actually abuse. And that's where their relationship gets weird and wrong for me is that he is abusive. Not He's not really abusive towards her, but he's... Oh, he is emotionally abusive towards yeah, her. If you he, ask me, I think he is emotionally abusive. And all of that, like, throwing things, punching walls, screaming oh, in yeah. your face stuff is concerning. abuse because it's all showing you, if I wanted to, I could hurt you. Yeah. Okay, so he's abusive towards her. Mm-hmm. And according to romance rules, that means that she falls in love with him. And yes, she's swept off her feet. And that's toxicity going back to original romance movies from the 20s. Like, this has been in every romance movie, and it's why romance movies are terrible. Yes, agreed. And and romance books, it's why I stopped reading romance, because so many of the plots revolved around an abusive, disrespectful, gross human being being the love interest because... Mm -hmm. She was going to, you know, she she could just put up with it long enough and then he would realize that he loved her and then he would be nice to her and Mm -hmm. everything would be okay, which is the line of nonsense that women are fed day after day after day. In this case, it's he's going to realize he loves her and then he will kill people for her, which is a horror twist. So here's the thing. I told you about halfway through, unless she (laughs) starts murdering people, this movie is irredeemable. Mm -hmm. And it saved itself at the very, very end. Literally within two minutes of the ending. So it did the thing I wanted, but it did it so late and it did it without any, there was a way it could have, it could have hinted. It could have been like, "Mm," it could have showed us bottles of medication where, yeah, she's taking cancer meds, but she's also taking antipsychotics that she maybe should Uh keep taking and not throw away. Like there would be things that we could have seen that would have like set it up like, Ooh, Uh Oh, what's really happening. You had to believe that there was an unreliable narrator and there was no hint of that. It was all just tropey romance garbage. Until the very end, when it suddenly became the movie I wanted it to be all along. Yeah. That scene where backstage, she doesn't even choose to do this. She's like, the monster just comes out of the wall there. And she's like, oh, it's the monster. Yay. And he slices the throat of her ex. Oh, no, no, no. She chose. She brought the monster out. I mean, when we know that it's in her head. Well, no, because... 
she went over and she grabbed that ruler and broke it yeah, in half. And did. I was like, oh, ho, 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 here it comes. <laughs> like she, she did that intentionally. And I think ultimately because she did that, because first of all, she like locked the monster up in the closet and got rid of it. And then she calls it out. That's the, that's her arc, right? She's a mouse. She's a doormat. She spends this time with monster who teaches her how to not be those things. She, you know, refuses the call to madness or horror or whatever. And then she accepts the call and brings him out. That's her arc. Mm -hmm. If that had been the story for real, like if that had really happened in this movie in a way that didn't make me sit there and wait for an hour and a half to get to it. (laughs) That would have been a good movie. Yeah. That's why that, that last scene, she's belting out a Broadway song Mm -hmm. with blood all over her shirt. (laughs) And uh, halfway through the song, the camera pulls back. So you can see that there's her ex-boyfriend's dead body on the ground with a pool of blood. And the whole audience is watching it. That was it, unbelievably unrealistic. They all waited for the entire song before they were like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> Is this part of the play? <laughs> and then they all freaked out and like were like running. Yeah. That's insane, but I get it. It's artistic. But again, I think that also works for me because of the unreliable narrator piece. Like she was yeah. in her head performing this thing. Yeah. That was really the reason why she killed him in the first place. So like I, that had you know, um, into the woods musical feel to it. Like every once in a while it would get this Broadway musical feel, but most of the time it was just bad hallmark. There was shortly before that. So she was not supposed to be in the play. He had fired her. She was going to be in the play as a side character, but he fired her because she went nuts on him and said terrible things to him. Him being the director, her ex-boyfriend, created this play with her, told her she was going to be the main character, then dumped her when she had cancer. Mm -hmm. So great guy. Mm -hmm. And now that's why he needs to be murdered. I mean, no big loss from the world. No. So in the end, she sneaks onto the play, (laughs) which is confusing. She arranges with the woman who is supposed to play the main character, who has only just now realized that she's kind of being used to edge the main character out. Yeah. She arranges to switch places with her because she's supposed to be the understudy. And, you know, so the other woman lets her take the role. Yeah, except she's not the understudy anymore because no, she got fired. fired. <laughs> because she lost her mind uh-huh. during a rehearsal. So she's performing the play. And that part was good, too. It was like, you know, it w- we were seeing the play, but not in order. It was just mm-hmm. kind of a montage mess. But still... What's with all the people working on the play who are just like going along with it and like, okay. And then at the intermission, the guy who was playing opposite her is like, Laura, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. it, you didn't realize it was her till now? I don't know. I mean, obviously, the show must go on. Obviously. But then her ex is like, you're performing it totally different than. The play I invented, and I don't think she was. I think she was doing the play. Here's the thing. I don't think we ever really saw the play that he wrote, because I suspect, given Mm. the character that he is, the play he wrote had no empowered females in it at all. We should discuss what this play is about. Because... Like, I'm pretty sure the whole, like, it was very male gaze in that there were all of these, you know, schoolgirls in short skirts <laughs> being reprimanded by their headmaster. So I think, you know, he, what did he call it? The It was something like the school for good girls. It was something of good girls or for good girls. Yes. And during one of the, like, the the first table read, he's like talking about how Uh it's about women empowerment and whatever. There was no women empowerment in it. Yeah, it was a real, you know, uh, wannabe liberal kind of thing. Like, Yes. Yeah. But when she started playing it, because she was playing it from her place of being empowered, like, I think she... By the monster. (laughs) By a man. Right? (laughs) Why is is the powerful part of her brain a man? (laughs) Yeah, you know, actually, that could have been a whole different relationship. Right? Right. Imagine how different and more interesting this movie could have been if we thought she was falling in love with the 
female monster in her closet. And then we realize that it's her. Uh They probably wanted to do that, but they couldn't figure out how to make a monster that was female because it wouldn't have looked like the guy from Beauty and the Beast. (laughs) It makes me angry that they took a premise that should have been so good. Like the idea that like this guy dumped her, she put all this effort into making his Mm -hmm. play work. He just bailed as soon as she got sick and also is giving her no credit for the work that she put into it and is sleeping with her best friend. And and she also has this side story of realizing that her best friend is not a good friend and confronting her about that, which is, I liked and realizing that she and the other um, actress who gets the main role are being pitted against each other and they figure it out and they like, team up yes like there were good things about this but yeah i i and that's what i see like i was kind of enjoying it because of those things and i'm like but then what's with this monster and why is he like this because it her ex was like that he was absolutely horrible he was the extremely over the top nasty guy x Mm -hmm. that's in every rom-com and Mm -hmm. that was really fun knowing that you know he was gonna get well we didn't know he'd get murdered but it was likely and that was fun like that was the thing but then there's this whole romance with somebody who's just as toxic and that was confusing yeah and she was i i i understand why they did this part of it they were trying to show the arc that she was going through, but she was so, so pathetic at the beginning. <laughs> yes, she was. And I didn't mind. It was fine. It was annoying. It was, I think it would have been fine, except that it's on the back of all of these other movies where that's what women are portrayed as. Yeah. As being complete victims all the time, whiny, whiny. You know, the kinds of characters that the dude bros on IMDb (laughs) say like, oh, well, I'm not surprised he left her when she got cancer. She seemed a little needy to me. Yes. Like, Uh, it's... Quoted from an actual review I saw on IMDb. It's just, it's the offensive woman stereotype Uh that is so prevalent, but then also we're all criticized for being like that. Even though we're all told to be like that by every form of media we are fed our whole lives. But to be fair, that is the arc here. You know, she is walked all over and she finds her strength via murder. And only because a quote unquote man taught her. And I get I'm 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 putting the quotes around <laughs> it because now we know that the beast wasn't really a man. It was her but why did it have to be a man through the whole movie? Like, really? She couldn't, we couldn't have given her the agency to come up with these things on her own. We had to couch them into a male yeah. character. Yeah. I'm so angry about this movie. Yeah, I, I think that's a really valid complaint. And the idea of it, if it were just a female monster instead, that would have been a big change. Although, her. Her behavior would also have to change, but I think it would just because of Hollywood stereotypes. I think they could have kept a lot of it, actually. Oh, it's okay when women do it? No, okay, okay. I'm not saying if they were going to rewrite the entire movie and make it not a bad movie, yes, (laughs) I agree with what you're saying. But like, if they wanted to, they could have just straight up made that character a woman and left it exactly the yeah, same, that would and it would have worked anything. exactly the same way. There was nothing that was different about it, except that there's the sex scene, which still could have been a sex scene, and would have made more sense when you think about the reality of what that sex scene was, <laughs> now that we know that Monster is all in her head. Yeah, I had concerns, because I, you know, several times throughout this movie, I was thinking about, you know, what is the the lore, what is the how do monsters work in here? Because at one point we discover that there's like a magic tunnel going through her closet into his bachelor pad. Mm -hmm. And that's filled full of like all her lost toys and socks. I really liked the lost socks. That was the best part. It was, it was interesting, but again, (laughs) why wasn't that a, why, you know what? I looked at the socks on that chair. Like the chair is made up of lost (laughs) single socks. Yeah. They're all men's socks. It did seem like that, yeah. Like maybe she wears men's what? socks. 
<laughs> I don't know. What? But from a girl, he stole these men's athletic socks from a girl who spent the entire movie wearing prairie dresses. True. And potholder dresses. <laughs> okay. No one else in the world knows what a potholder dress is. I think it's self-explanatory, to be honest. <laughs> it's a quilted prairie dress. <laughs> So I'm sitting here thinking about the lore of what this monster is and how does this work? And I kept hoping, you know, something would happen in the movie that was like relevant to that. Like, oh, you know, he can only come out in the dark or something. And, you know, so that is affects the logistics of how some scene works, that kind of thing. But then they had sex. And the whole time I'm like, is he, is there something weird or is it? Is he just a human other than his face? Because I'm really concerned about what's happening here. Like, like what, what is down there? They didn't show us, thankfully. But yeah, I had concerns. Like, I, are we going to have issues? I don't know. When I hear monster, I don't think normal. No. Also, then she went to have blood work done. And I was like, oh, here's an interesting oh, moment. I didn't think of that at all. Yeah. So he's going to have half monster kids. She's not going to have any kids because there was only one person in that room. (laughs) What? Twist? It enrages me that that they took this idea that could have been done in such an amazing way and they just did it so badly that they ruined it and that they ruined it so hard that the next time a horror (laughs) romance shows up at the theaters, no one is going to go see it. Fun fact... We were the only two people in this theater. (laughs) Yes. So, yeah. So it's already a hard sell. But I think it could, if it had been done well, that could become a thing. But it was not. A film that keeps coming to mind as we talk about this is Tragedy Girls, which we gave very high ratings to. Mm -hmm. Not a romance, but definitely a horror comedy. And it was about this relationship between the two girls who were serial killers and it was like a horror buddy comedy. Yeah. Like and it was really horrific because they were Michael Myers type killers and mm-hmm. they were cutting everybody up. And it's very different from this but also it's kind of the same with a colorful light version with the gore. Like a bigger than life yeah. character's story that sort of thing. Yeah. And that also had like a stage musical energy to it. Yeah. Yeah, cuz very over the top. And that's where this needed to go. Like, she needed to kill... She should have killed her friend. She should. She did kill her ex. Um, I don't know if there was anybody else she needed to kill, but they should have fixed the story so there were other people she needed to kill. Mm-hmm. And, you know, have mm-hmm. it go on a whole thing. And then the cops are after her, and she's having to deal with that. That's... One of the things that I would have done, like I was trying to think as I was watching it, I was like, what would I prefer to this? Because this is not fun to watch. I was thinking if she had murdered him much earlier on, and then she was falling in love with Monster while she was trying to evade capture. Yeah. Like that felt like there would have been a reason. There was no reason for her to fall in love with this monster. He was abusive and, <laughs> and terrible. There was not one thing that that should have made her fall in love with this other character. He was charming. He wasn't. I kept, for the early part of the movie, I was like, that's not Ryan Reynolds, is it? Because he had a very Ryan Reynolds style of being with all, all like the sarcastic comments and stuff. It was like she was falling in love with Deadpool. So obviously, okay, love. But hear me when I say Deadpool is a better person than Monster. <laughs> That's terrifying. Right? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Like when you dig down into these characters, Deadpool is chaotic and doesn't care about any laws or rules, right? He is total and utter chaos. But he has a moral code that he Mm -hmm. follows that makes some kind of sense. Like, he would have sought vengeance for the way this woman was treated, perhaps. But he wouldn't have negged the woman while he was doing it. Well, and that's just uh, another thing in this movie is that he, he kept getting revenge for her. Like, that was his whole thing. And that isn't great <laughs> like like I mean, he he protects her in the form of hurting other people 
Right. I mean, really, it that's that part actually makes sense once you know what's really going on. Yeah. And uh, you know what? Even if it wasn't that, even if he Beast was a or monster <laughs> was a real thing, mm-hmm. and he decided, you know, the alternative could have been that Monster was Sully, the monster from her closet from when she was a kid, who she developed some kind of relationship with, and they bonded in some way. And so now when she's being hurt, he comes out and seeks to avenge her. Like, imagine if you took Monsters, Inc. and made it like an actual horror movie. Yeah. That would be an interesting movie. Well, and like so many other movies, having that element of he's a monster, he he sees her getting hurt and he wants to tear people to pieces. Mm-hmm. And like in Venom or Terminator or one of those movies, her whole thing has to be pulling him back and like, no, no, we don't kill people. We, you know, you can tell him off or whatever, but just stop. And learning to stand up for herself and have a backbone without having to murder. Mm-hmm. Like there's the story. Yeah. But you know what? I'm even okay with she becomes a murderer. Like, I'm fine with yeah, her being a, a non hero. Ugh. It just was not, it was so bad. I don't, I can't, I don't even have anything more to say other than it was so bad. Ratings. We talked about the different kind of subplots here, you know, that basically the different people that wronged her, really. And it's like you said, there's an interesting story there to be told. And imagine this. Oh, imagine this. The whole movie being in the framework of the musical. Mm -hmm. The movie starts with the beginning of the musical being performed that night when she's taking over. And when the movie starts, you think she belongs in that role. It's Mm. not until much later in the film, as they've cut back and forth between the musical and the events, that you see that she's actually sneaking on stage. And, if I might add to this fantasy piece here yes monster we get to see the musical he actually wrote which Mm -hmm. we i think it there was just the slightest little hint where we see that opening scene and she's all like yes headmaster Uh no headmaster but we see a little more we see fleshed out the trash play that he actually wanted performed i mean that's like the whole thing like uh it's just one of those things that the middle-aged white guys create where they're like i'm being so feminist and Mm -hmm. because i think his real play is not about them being submissive it is about her standing up and going i'm not like that you can't you know keep me down but in a terrible way in that and then she falls in love with the headmaster oh of course yeah because she he turns around and is like you are so strong it very grease like right like (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Okay, I'm I'm with you though. I think I I'm with you. Framework of the play. We yeah. don't know if she's not supposed to be there. Oh it all gosh. unfolds. Now I'm really excited for that movie. There are so many ways this movie could have gone and that would would have most been importantly, that movie would be a full on musical. Like uh-huh. there'd be ten songs. Uh huh. Yeah. So get Rachel Bloom. Get on it. <laughs> she would write this. Well. I, I hope she's listening to our podcast. I mean, obviously. I think she is. But that's not what we got. Mm -hmm. What we got had those ideas, but didn't really execute on any of them. Like like her friend being so dismissive to her and thinking she's doing a great job of being a friend. And then she disappears for two thirds of the movie before we even see her again, really. And it's like that needed to happen more. Like all of those things needed more context, more connection. So... I will give props to, I liked the main girl. She was doing good. I liked the Ryan Reynolds-like delivery of the monster. And there were funny lines. There were some funny bits. And I liked the stage director, although I had no idea what was going on with him, but it was fun to see whatever it was. He was just like a brain injury (laughs) wandering around the world. Like I don't know what his deal was, but it was funny. So it had that going for it, but it was just not there. And if if I had only seen the last three minutes of this movie, mm-hmm. I would be like, that looks like a great movie. Mm-hmm. But no, it it does that's you have to do better than that mm-hmm. for it to work. So I award this film one and a half sesame chickens out of five. Okay. 
I thought of another way that it could have gone. Okay. Like, there are so, there are as long as it's a musical. Number, there are an infinite number of ways that it could have been better. It, it, this piece, you know, musical, not musical, whatever. Like, it's it, within whatever. But if she had shown up there and this monster had been treating her the way he was treating her, and she, over time, started standing up to monster. Yeah, and that's how like, you learn. Dude. That's my mother's china. Stop throwing it on the floor. Yeah. Put that back in the cabinet. Yeah. Like not going along with everything that he said, but like starting to stand up against him and starting to be like, you know what? You don't get to walk into the bathroom when I'm in here without knocking. Get the hell out. Yeah. Get out. His whole thing was the classic toxicity of the romance genre, which I do not understand. And and so there's a way that she could have like grown in and of herself because of her interaction with him that then she could have used to interact differently with her toxic friend and her toxic ex and, you know, whatever. Yeah. And it still would have worked when we found out that Monster didn't really exist because it would still make sense that she's the one who figured these things mm-hmm. out and she started standing up to the monster in her head like... Yeah. So many ways this could have been better. Self-talk monster. So there was a point probably halfway through the movie where I I realized that I was watching the movie, but I was watching it with like an angry scowl on my face. Like I was literally scowling at the movie like it could see how (laughs) disappointed I was in it. And I'm like, huh, I'm going to give this movie a zero. Like Uh, I decided. I decided in that moment I was like. Yeah, this has all the hallmarks of every movie I have ever given a zero to. This is right there with it. This is a zero. And I had decided. And then I think I turned to you and I said, unless she starts murdering murdering people, (laughs) this movie is irredeemable. You did. And then in the last five minutes of the movie, she murders someone. And it becomes the movie that I wanted it to be all along. So. Sounds like five stars. Because they did the thing, I'm not going to give this movie a zero. Okay. But because I had to slog through all of the zero movie to get to the thing, <laughs> yeah, I am going to give this movie one half. Oh. 0.5. Once again, I'd like to point out that that is not one of our valid ratings. 0.5. Sesame chickens out of five, because truly this movie, it is not worth going through everything that I had to sit through to get to that piece. It's It's not worth it. I agree. I don't think people should watch this movie. And frankly, I don't think this movie should have been made. Yeah. Well, it should have. We we have acknowledged that it absolutely should have. This movie shouldn't have been made. (laughs) This movie should have been rewritten by people who could have made this storyline into a good movie yeah i want a number of versions of this movie (laughs) but i do not want this one it's just further evidence that we are living in the worst timeline well we know that to be true so point five says me chickens all right well we only watch movies in the theater now so we're gonna go watch another one and come back and tell you about it okay bye okay bye Talking into a fan.